Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, a consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to Nerve Puzzle number 10. This case, as with all previous cases, is purely hypothetical and any resemblance to any individual is purely coincidental. Let's start. We have a 32-year-old lady who has just given birth. She required an epidural during labour and it was also quite prolonged. Since then, she has had foot drop with associated numbness across the foot and the lateral calf too and there's been no improvement three weeks later. On clinical examination, there is no visible muscle wasting. However, tone is reduced in the left ankle. Power is reduced 2 out of 5 for dorsiflexion, normal plantar flexion and inversion, and 4 out of 5 hip abduction and knee flexion. Sensation was reduced to pinprick in the lateral calf and the dorsum of the foot. Let's consider the differential diagnosis. Could this be a single nerve lesion of perhaps the perineal nerve? Unfortunately, this isn't the case here because we've also got weakness of knee flexion and that involves the hamstrings and also of hip abduction, which involves the gluteal muscles. Could it be a higher up nerve lesion, for example, um, lumbosacral plexus? Well, that's very much a possibility. Could this be something higher up still? Could this be a radiculopathy? Could there have been some kind of trauma related to the epidural? Well, I suppose that's a possibility and that tends to be the type of referral that we get in these kind of scenarios. Um, so, so that's something else that could be considered too. So let's try and differentiate what's going on here using the neurophysiology findings. And so if we start with the sensory nerve action potentials, we've got an absent left superficial perineal nerve response and the left sorrel sensory response is reduced compared to the other side. And so what we're clearly dealing with here is a postganglionic process, so we can rule out the radiculopathy. Let's have a look at the motor findings. We've got normal distal latency for the left perineal EDB. We've got normal and appropriate conduction velocities, speeding up as it goes proximally across the fibular neck. However, we can see small motor amplitudes, especially when we compare to the other side. We also have a prolonged F latency as well, of 56 versus the 46. If we have a look at the posterior tibial nerve to the AH muscle, we can similarly see a reduction in the motor amplitude and also prolongation of the F latency too. Let's have a look at the EMG findings now. If we have a look at the tibialis anterior muscle, we can see moderate acute denervation in this muscle and we can see a slightly lesser degree of denervation in the gastrocnemius muscle which is of course innervated through the tibial nerve. Moving more proximally we can similarly see a greater degree of denervation in the perineal division innervated biceps femoris short head and a lesser degree in the semimembranosus muscle. Higher still we can see with the gluteal muscles um, some degree of acute denervation as well and if we have a look at the lumbar paraspinals these are normal and if we can look at the femoral innervated muscles the rectus femoris and the vastus medialis these are normal. Let's put this all together now. We've got reduced amplitude sural sensory responses and absent superficial perineal sensory response and so we're definitely dealing with a postganglionic process. We've got reduced motor amplitudes, particularly affecting the perineal innervated EDB muscle. We've got on EMG a similar pattern of acute and moderate denervation in the perineal innervated muscles and to a, a greater extent than that which is present in the tibial fiber innervated muscles. It's also affecting the gluteal muscles too and is sparing the paraspinal level muscles and also the femoral innervated muscles. And so we can say in conclusion that we have a moderate acute left lumbosacral plexopathy. This kind of scenario is known as a postpartum plexopathy, which is not uncommon and is something that we see from time to time. What happens here is that the baby's head pushes the nerve fibers of the lumbosacral plexus against the bony brim and particularly those originating from L5 level and so it's quite easy to understand how this can be confused for an L5 radiculopathy or even a perineal nerve palsy across the fibula neck too. 
Unfortunately, the finger of blame tends to be pointed towards the anesthesiologists with the epidurals uh, and how they're placed. However, it's important to realize that when the anesthesiologist does this uh, procedure, they tend to do it up at thoracic level, much higher up than at lumbar level. And the reason for that is because if they need to convert uh, to a caesarean section, they need to make sure that the, the entire area of the abdomen, where they're potentially going to be making uh, an incision to deliver the baby, is properly anaesthetized. And so that's why they tend to place their epidural blocks much higher up and then these um, root level issues could possibly uh, be causative. It's also always worthwhile considering the differential here, particularly with perineal nerve uh, compression across the fibular neck, because sometimes in these scenarios, ladies can have their um, legs up in stirrups and it's easy for there to be compression neuropathy. So it's a very important differential to consider. Obviously in this case, we've shown uh, more denervation more proximally to that, uh, both on the nerve conduction and most importantly clinically as well. The good news with this kind of scenario is that on the whole they tend to resolve, it tends to be a biphasic response uh, in terms of any demyelination um, resolving fairly quickly over the first couple of weeks and so there's an initial peak of improvement and this is then followed by axonal regeneration and regrowth and uh, usually the outcome is quite good. Just a couple of neurophysiological points, if I may. Of course, pre and post ganglionic lesion localization is vital, so it's important you know how to do your sensory responses perfectly. Um, in terms of lesion localization, gluteal muscle sampling is really vital here because that way you can differentiate a lumbosacral plexopathy from a sciatic nerve lesion because a sciatic nerve lesion will not involve the gluteal muscles. A lumbosacral plexopathy of course will. The final point, and this is particularly relevant in this scenario, is to do paraspinal muscle sampling with EMG to really demonstrate that there is no more proximal involvement than this, uh, than the lumbosacral uh, plexus level. I hope you found this video useful and if you have found it useful, please do support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Thank you very much and I hope to see you in the next video shortly.